Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm genuinely delighted to have a bit of a megastar, Morgan J. Ingram, who is the Director of Sales Execution and Evolution at JB Sales Training. Morgan, welcome. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Happy to be here. Excellent. Morgan, you work with hundreds of SDRs, so sales development reps, over the course of each year. I'm really curious to understand why is it they are largely mistreated and undervalued? I think that's because that's how the system has set them up to be undervalued, right? So when you come in, it's like, hey, your entry-level job, all you're doing is cold calling, all you're doing is emailing, and just get after it. And there's no appreciation of that. Now, organizations have started to do a good job on some ends to start giving them like, hey, congrats, but most don't. Like when they source a deal, they don't get any congrats. It's just like, oh, you hit 100% of quota, like go do it again. And so now you're just undervalued. You're like, man, I don't get any props for what I'm doing. I, I want to at least get some recognition. And managers, leaders sometimes don't do that. And now you're sitting there like, man, this sucks. And you go do something else. I've been interviewing a number of junior salespeople who've gone through SDR, maybe moving into an AE role. And there are some common themes. The first one is the high turnover rate. What on God's earth is that about? Why would you burn through so many reps? I think it's one of those things is that because you can, right? In some organizations, they know, hey, look, we have a good name or hey, we have a good product. And now we can just, we can just go through as many reps as possible. And so let's just keep getting them. And if you don't work, you don't work. And also it comes down to managers as well is that, hey, I was a top rep at some point as a manager, right? And I'm now a new manager. And if you don't do it the way that I did it, then I'm like, you're just not good. And then I'm just going to, you're going to be burnt out and I'm going to find the person that wants to do what I want to do. So it's those two sides of the coin that make it hard for someone coming into the role if they don't get proper coaching. And if they're just like, well, we just see as a number, just keep coming in. I'll come back to coaching in a minute because it's a particular bugbear of mine and it'll be an important part of this conversation. Often what I see is companies recruit, they create this revolving door in sales and they recruit 12 in the hope that three or four might work out. Of those three or four, the ones that get promoted into management are the top producers, not the ones best suited for management. So again, what are you seeing in terms of the most enlightened forward-thinking companies in terms of identifying people who have management capability and they are training them and giving them a career path to develop those skills before they move into management. Yeah. So, I mean, the first part, you know, Marcus, we can both agree on this, is that just because you do really well in an individual contributor role does not mean that you'll be a great manager. Absolutely. So what you should be looking for as a leader to figure out who's going to be the manager is a couple of things. One is, is the rep proactively coaching already? Are they helping people out? Are they giving advice without you, having to, without you having to tell them to do it? So they're already showing signs of that leadership. Two is they take on additional projects that maybe are outside the sales team. They're working with marketing. They're working with customer success. They're doing those things as well. And number three is what I'm looking out for if that, if that person's a rep is, are they proactively going to the manager and looking for coaching themselves, right? So then I know that when this manager becomes a manager, that means that they are willing to humble themselves and figure out, like, I don't know everything. I need to go learn some more information. So those are three things that I look for to figure out, like, if this person can be a leader. If they're not doing these things, they're not a bad person, but you just probably aren't fit to be that effective of a leader because you're not showing those signs early. Absolutely. You need to be vulnerable, which requires courage. Mm -hmm. You need to be open-minded, Otherwise, you're going to be brittle when it comes to criticism. You need to invite the feedback, even when you'd rather not hear it because it hurts. And you have to be proactive in terms of how you're helping others. The best managers are rarely the top producers. They're often the ones that have the widest and deepest account penetration. They're the ones that are are definitively going out there and coaching and helping other people. They're the ones that roll up their sleeves because they derive satisfaction from seeing others succeed. Okay, so tell me this, onboarding. My experience Mm. uh, for a a lot of organizations is, congratulations, you're a salesperson now, here's a phone, here's a list, cool. (laughs) 
what are you advising your clients to do in terms of a proper structured onboarding process and over what period of time? Yeah, so you're right. It's like, here's your key card. There's the bathroom. <laughs> here's the phone. Get after it. Good luck. Right. Maybe there's a coffee machine yeah. if you got the one, right? So most, most of the people I know just got told to pee in the corner. <laughs> so we, we gotta vault past that, right? So first and foremost, it's it's 90 days. Especially if we're talking about SDRs, it's 90 days. You, you will be able to make a decision if this SDR is going to be great, good, or someone who's not gonna last very long. You can decipher that in 90 days. Now, what do you do in those 90 days? When someone first comes in, the, the one of the very first things that you should do, and this is what we did when I was onboarding reps and when I suggest my clients to do, is say, hey, look, show them the landscape of the market. And what I mean by that is, what do we stand for? Why are we even here, right? Why are we a company? And then who are our competitors and who are we, who are we going after? I think that a lot of times, and I know a lot of times, is that SDRs are calling people and they have no idea why they're calling them. Yeah. Yeah. I, could, I could ask a rep, like, why are you calling the CIO? They have no idea. They just know they need to call them to hit their number. But they don't know why they're calling them. I've just come off an interview with David Hensel, who set up UpCoach and a raft of others, uh, Max CDN and so on. And he says that he starts each conversation with his teams around vision, mission, and values. And that's what you've just described there. Uh, in the recruitment process, if you don't talk about those things, particularly with the millennials and Gen Z, then you're going to lose those people because they, they want to do something more than just be a grunt. Fair? Yep, absolutely. Building on that, so understanding why they're, they're in business, what next? So now that you understand that, now we have to get to the soft skills, right? And understanding in business, like this should be something that's ongoing, but the first two weeks should be dedicated to that as part of the onboarding process. And but by obviously, soft skills, you mean? Yep, so soft skills, and what I'll get into that is like cold calling, right? How to write emails, organizational time. Now, the way to expedite that, you can't really do it to, in today's world, but like if we were go to go back to the office, right, in a normal onboarding setting, is to have them shadow one of the reps. So every single rep that came in as part of the class, they would then be a shadow to one of the reps and you would see how they made calls, how they do emails, how they organize their time. So then that got the onboarding process faster. And then before we, we did it, this everyone's different, but I just suggest we did a cold calling certification process before you could get on the phones. So you had to do a mock cold call with us and we had to determine whether or not you were ready to get on the phone, because if you sounded shaky, then we wouldn't get you on the phone yet. We would have to make sure that you sounded legit before you could move forward. So like, those are things that we did. Okay, I noticed gladly that there's no mention of product. Not, not yet. See, so not, not yet. Because what ends up happening is you give them too much product and they get overwhelmed and then they feel like they have to spew it on people. And product is like right after the skill. So I'm, the product is the third piece. Now, here's the thing. Everyone's going to have different debates on this. They're going to be like, well, Morgan, like they need to know the product. Or like, we have a very complex product and they need to learn it. I oh. understand that. I understand that piece, right? But again, to your point, they need to know those other two things before we even get to the product. No one in the history of humanity has ever bought your product. No one buys sales training. No one buys CRM systems. No one buys routers. And uh, no one buys ERP systems. Those are the means to an end. And no one cares. It's like showing photos of your ugly children to strangers. <laughs> so when you talk about the product, how important is it that the sales rep is always equipped with the question, well, Morgan, that's great, but why would anyone care? And how do I use that information to sell it? We're only giving product information that's enough for them to be dangerous, but <laughs> not to overwhelm them. Right. Because that's what ends up happening, right? I give you all this product knowledge, like you said, like everything that people are buying is to like, we were, we're talking about here to solve your problem, to accomplish a priority, right? And yeah. that's why I'm going to get it right? Am I in love with chairs? No, but it, <laughs> but I sit in them so it's more comfortable, right? So like, that's the thing right there that we're talking about. So at the end of the day, I'm giving you just product knowledge because we know there's certain objections that are going to come up. So you need to at least be knowledgeable to some degree, but I'm not going to give you every single thing about the product because you're going to be so overwhelmed and you're just going to value vomit on people. And that's what I hear a lot is people know 
all these things about the product, but they don't have the soft skills to convert the meeting. Well, it's like, you're not a, you're not a commercial, right? You're, you're a salesperson to get people's contacts so that they can schedule that meeting. So that's why there's going to be product knowledge in there, but it's enough for you to be dangerous not to overwhelm you. What are you teaching people about listening? That's key. So in an act of listening, right? One thing I tell people is when you're in a conversation, listen for words that don't sound normal. Can you give me an example? So I'll give you an example. So if you're having a, let's say I'm called someone and they're talking about sales training. Then they say, yeah, like our team is skyrocketing right now. I'm like, skyrocketing? Like, what does that mean? Right? Or someone's like, yeah, you know, our, our quotas have been like changing and our team's a little bit wishy-washy on their skills. And I'm like, oh, wishy-washy, like, what does that mean? So there's certain words that like people say in a conversation where you're like, all right, that word is an abnormal word. Let's drill deeper into that, right? So I find certain words that people will say like lower, skyrocketing, it, you know, like some people say we're all set. Like I always just drill in certain words that like, okay, that doesn't make sense there. Let's figure out what that really does mean. Because in conversations, people give you clues yet you have to hone in to figure out where is that word or where's that clue so I can uncover what's really going on. So that's why I teach people active listening. And then over time, you get better once you start listening for words that like don't make sense. And then your conversations get better. So, I mean, the the fundamental rule here is prospects will tell you how to sell to them. And if you listen for those words and then you reflect them back, they will typically go deeper and your job is to gather information. It's not to give it. Um, but so many salespeople get taught a script. They get taught to pitch. I mean, when, when was the last time anybody enjoyed being sold to? <laughs> it doesn't happen. People hate to be sold. They love to buy, but they hate to be sold. Hate it. Why is it that still, I mean, it's, it's not like the, the evidence isn't out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. We only have to look at our own experience of the misery that we have to go through when bad sales reps pitch us. So so it's two things. One is, and this is is for y'all out there, get rid of the scripts. Yep. Like, I, I do not like scripts. What I believe in is formulas. Because with the formula, it allows people to add their personality to it. With the script, I'm telling you exactly what to do. I'm like, all right, you have to do this way. I give suggestions based on the formula that I have, but if you follow the formula, it will work, right? If you don't, then, you know, (laughs) just follow it, right? So that's number one is that there's scripts out there. And then now you're telling me to, to, my second point is to make these calls. Now I tell people, right? You should tell your team, this is an expectation we have. Hey, this is what you should do if you want to be successful. However, it's not a requirement because you may find other ways to be successful. You may not have to make as many dials as that person over there because you might get on the phone and actually be able to convert more. So what I'm more focused on is, what's the process of your cold call? Like when you get on the phone, can you convert? So we would always have coaching around, what's your intro? How do you handle objections? How are you leaving voicemails? Like that's what I care about. Make your dials, make your dials. The only time I'm gonna get upset with someone and have a conversation with them about dial metrics is if they're not doing well. But hey, look, this is the expectation. You should do this. We've seen this to be successful. But really what I'm focused on is what is your output? What's your results? If you're making 20 calls a day and you're getting the same results as someone who's making 100 calls a day, then that person with 20 calls a day is clearly doing something right. So I think we focus way too much on the metrics and like forcing on everyone and not look at each individual rep to figure out like what is best for them. I, I, extracting a number of points from what you've just said, the obsession with efficiency over effectiveness is a a huge problem. I think so many people measure the wrong things because having an effective call is better than having 100 ineffective calls. We see so many people operating on the basis of using a script, but there's a fundamental flaw with that, which is the prospect doesn't have the script and doesn't follow it. So the minute they go off script, then you get derailed. And that's where... You're like, uh. <laughs> uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, more often than not, we haven't touched on this yet, but I'm curious. What about intent? When you're calling, what mm. does your intent need to be? So when you say intent, does that mean like, what is your intro? Or no. are you saying... No, no, what, what's your intention no. with the call? And where, where does your focus need to be? 
So, okay, I got it. So your focus for the call, especially for SDR, or really anyone who's prospecting and looking to get a meeting, is to get a meeting. Like, your goal is to close for a meeting. It isn't to, unless you have a very transactional sell, is to close just for the meeting and to get next steps there. So if you're sitting on that phone call and you're there for like 30, 40 minutes, like, that's not the purpose of it. The purpose is, hey, I'm calling you to get interest, right? To figure out, like, is there a little bit of interest for you to move forward the next step, which is a meeting? I'm going to then meet with you to figure out, like, okay, is there enough desire for this person to actually buy whatever I'm selling them based on the problems or parties that they have? So the, your intent should always be, I'm looking to close for the meeting, and that's it. If you, if you think of anything else, then that's why you're probably getting derailed on calls right now. Okay, do you mind if I challenge you a little? Yeah. I think if we're, all we're doing is we're focused on our selfish self-interest. Mm -hmm. which is securing the meeting, then that's projected out and reflected back by the prospect. Certainly what I'm teaching my clients is that we have to establish, can we help? If we can, mm -hmm. are we the right people to help? And then we do them a disservice if we do not secure the meeting. But I think part of the problem so often is that salespeople meet every stereotype that we as buyers hate, which is <laughs> that they're pushy and they're self-interested yep. and they're greedy and so on. So I, I just temper that with a, a little bit of forethought and the insight that if you're establishing whether or not you can help and serve that person, then it doesn't feel like you're trying to put your hand in their pocket. And that, that's certainly been my experience, uh, both being on the receiving end and mm -hmm. early in my career, where I was so fixated on hitting my quota that I didn't really get permission. I wasn't nurturing. I didn't listen. And all of these things worked against me. And it took years because I didn't have coaching to work it out for myself. Uh, your thoughts? So I, I agree with that. So to go on, what I was saying in intent is I feel like when people make cold calls, they just make calls to make calls. And they're right. just like, I'm just doing my thing. Yeah. And when they get on the call, they don't close for next steps when, like you just said, they need to. They go on a dialogue and they continue to have a conversation and they never close. They expect the prospect to close themselves. So when I say, hey, your intention should be to set the meeting, it's know when to close based on when you've done that act of listening that we just talked about. Because a lot of people, and when I coach people, is they never ask for the next steps. They never guide the prospect to where they need to go. They are just hoping that the prospect just says, I really like this and move forward, which we know that's not going to happen for Absolutely. the most part. So that when I say set the meeting, I mean, make sure that you're closing for next steps when you've done everything that you just said, Marcus, because I feel like that's a key step that people just completely miss. And they're just expecting people to be like, oh, this sounds awesome. Let me meet with you. And we know that's not going to happen. <laughs> and they're, they're also waiting to trip over the Valley of Lost Prospects as well. <laughs> and so, again, rule of thumb, in my experience, if a call is shorter than three minutes or longer than eight minutes, there's something that you're doing wrong. Either you're calling the wrong people or you're not engaging and you're not creating enough curiosity and value early, mm. or you're moving into selling if you go over eight minutes. Virtually every successful uh, cold call that I've come across is within that sort of uh, range. And again, it's important that you as an SDR listen to your own calls. Now, under lockdown, you should be recording pretty much every call and uh, if you're not using conversational analytics tools like Gong or Refract or Chorus, then pay for it yourself if you have to, so you can get better. Thoughts? I agree on that. I've, you have to own your development. And this is something that I, when people are like, well, what if my manager like doesn't help me? It's like, all right, well, <laughs> there's YouTube, LinkedIn, podcasts, courses. Like, There's so many things out here that if you're not owning your own develop, it's ultimately going to be on you because there is too many resources to blame someone else. And so you should look at yourself and be like, all right, what tools and resources do I need? And I do that all the time. Oh man, you know what? I'm not doing well in this area. Let me go find the resource to help me. I don't complain and point at fingers at other people. I always point it back at myself. So if you're out there saying, oh, well, no one's helping me, like help yourself and go find these resources, invest in yourself and take 20, I think it's like, yeah, I take 20% of the income I make per month and it's then allocated towards personal development. Now, whether that's a course, a book or whatever I decide to do, I encourage you to do the same thing because if you invest in yourself, that always is going to be ROI positive if you execute it to do something. 
fabulous philosophy. And also just a, a word of warning to those of you who are saying, well, my company's not investing in me. The bad news is your CEO, your VP of sales and your sales manager are still getting their mortgages paid while you're starving. Invest in yourself. Um, yep. Okay, so let, let's look at the kind of culture that is created within many SDR teams. You and I both work to a large extent within tech scale-up uh, marketplace. Why is it that there are so many funded organizations that have been invested in by VC or private equity that drive burnout and really crappy behaviors? Why do they keep doing it? Well, because they always know there's going to be a ne next man up mentality. There's always going to be that rep who's going to be hungry to come in and we'll just go through it. And also as well, you have to look, you know, you mentioned it from the investor side is that the investors are like, all right, I put X amount of money into this company and I need to get it back. So our projected revenue goals are 5.5 X than what they probably normally should be, right? Then obviously the VP of sales has to take that and be like, all right, guys, we got to hit these numbers and they're just going to drive you and drive you and drive you. And as they're driving you, there is no conversation around mental health. What should you be doing for escapisms? Like taking walks or if you play games or if you read books or whatever that is. And there's no conversations around that. So you come into an organization and it's just like, hey, your job is just to hit this number. Best of luck. We don't really are going to give you any training. We're just going to tell you to go out there. And then you're also not told to like have your time to take those mental breaks so you don't have that burnout. And then they also know that, hey, look, I can just get more people if you're not, if this isn't for you. So that's what's happening. And it's, it's not good. And I'm, I'm hoping that throughout this entire thing that's been happening, that people are starting to open their eyes and realize that like, oh, okay, like I can have a flow within my life where if I prioritize my time, I can get myself, I can get my stuff done and also get away from the work. So it's not consuming me and I, and I have this burnout. So that's really like the cycle that's happening. And it's, Unfortunately. Well, the research on this, I interviewed Michael Puck, who uh, mm -hmm. works for uh, Unified Kron uh, Kronos now. And he's cited some research that highly engaged employees generate 290% higher revenue per employee. So if you don't care about your people and you only care about your pocketbook and the uh, ROI, having your people, your reps highly engaged and your SDRs highly engaged which means training them, being, uh, aligning them to your uh, mission, core, uh, core mission and values, coaching them, helping them develop themselves as a career, making them feel valued, being inclusive in your management, helping them have a voice, is actually likely to almost triple the revenue that you're going to generate out of each one of them. It's a false economy not to do it. So I interviewed a, a great uh, rep, Emily Lamb a couple of weeks back. Mm -hmm. And she said that she'd been through five jobs in five years. And that she found her groove now and she's doing really well. She's been promoted into an AE role. But you know, it was 12 people being hired, five making it through, one of them doing okay, the other th uh, three or four struggling. And it just strikes me that there's nowhere near enough learning going on uh, in terms mm -hmm. of lesson capture. Because one of the things that struck me from that conversation was people were making the same mistake time and time and time and time again. And uh, interviewing David Hensel, you know, he talks about everybody having to uh, put their mistakes into an error log. You mm -hmm. don't get punished for making a mistake, you get punished for hiding it. And why is it so few junior salespeople, well, actually, say, senior salespeople too, have a habit of lesson capture? So I think from the lesson capture aspect is that, well, from an earlier stage, right, is that you probably don't know how to go about and do that. So you're probably just like, I'm hoping that people just give me the lessons, right? And I think from the senior level, sometimes, not all, but sometimes people might be like, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm good. I don't, I don't want to want to learn anything more because I got it. Right. So you got these like two stages. Right. So I think from the earlier part, like we'll go there, is that you don't know how to really capture it. And also you're not documenting what you're doing. And I always tell people that like, hey, if you got let go, like document, like what happened? 
right? What were the lessons in there? But I think what happens is we just like think about the next thing. We're like, oh, that didn't work. So let me just go to the next thing there and not like documenting like what's working and what's not. Because people move so fast, they don't take that time to really collect that data. So that, that's what I really see it there. Is I think a lot of people don't know what, what to do there. And I think because it's moving so fast, which is not an excuse, you should take the time to be like, okay, what makes a good email? What makes a good cold call? And like having that documentation and what, and this is my last bit of advice on this right here is that my former boss always told me, you want to leave somewhere better than where you found it. So you want to have the resources, the documentation of what you did. So when you leave, you left some type of legacy within that department, organization, company, whatever level that you were at. Good advice again. So again, make a point of capturing the lessons after the calls, maybe call for 20 minutes, write down your lessons as you go, and then take five minutes to reflect, capture those lessons, see what you could do better or differently the next time you face the same situation. Uh, A journal is a really powerful tool. Uh, Again, something that should be implemented from at a management level and made part of the recruitment process so that people expect to keep that journal and then share those lessons. One of the things that I've found incredibly powerful is everyone uh, captures three lessons a day and on the daily huddle, uh, they share their lessons. On a Friday, someone teaches the lessons that they've learned that week. And the quickest way to learn something is to teach it. So get into the habit of supporting the other reps around you and uh, training and helping them, and look for them to help you back as well. Okay, so tell me this. If we look at the structure of SDR teams, you've got people who are new, they're shadowing people who are more experienced, they've got managers. How do you suggest that people make the best use of the range of skill, the range of experience within teams or pods? in order to advance themselves. So when you say advance themselves, is that like advance themselves into like a promotion, like an AE or customer well, success or advance themselves in the role? Yeah. Skills, first of all, in that role so that they get better and then to advance themselves in terms of career to get a promotion. Yeah, so what should be happening is there should be peer-led trainings. And a a lot of teams don't do this. It's only the manager. They're like, all right, here comes Bobby, the manager again. And I got to listen to him drone about whatever he's going to drone about. And so you start to get annoyed. You start to be bored. You start to be like, I don't want to listen to Bobby, even though he's my manager, right? So what reps will execute on is if they see another rep that's more successful than them, right? Because they're going to internally see that as like, that's my competition. Even though you're the same team, you're still like, hey, I still want to be at the top for myself. So when a peer comes into the training, it will be on certain skills. So when you take your SDR team, you need to break it down into what are the skills that they're learning in this role? So there's a couple, right? Cold calling skills, objection handling, writing emails, time management, video selling skills, right? And direct mail, right? So, and et cetera, there's a ton. So the thing, active listening. So the thing is that I'm going to then put all these skills down to figure out like who on my team is the best at this. Sally's a great writer. Brent's a great caller. Samantha's a great person on video. So what now I'm going to do is focus on them to figure out like how are they doing this really well. And so then I'm going to ask them, hey, can you, can you lead a quick training for the team like 45 minutes? And the thing is that we talked about burnout, that is going to make the SDR more engaged. Oh, I got asked to do a training for my team? That's awesome, Right. SDRs don't get asked that. So now I'm building engagement within my team. I'm also getting the rep to share their insights and it's not me anymore, right? Now, because they're sharing their insights, people actually do the skills more. And then ultimately, because everyone is sharing their skills, everyone is engaged, everyone is involved with the team and it's like a family, now it's going to be easier for these people to get promotions because everyone's learning all these different skills from people all across the way. And it's not just this one rep doing their one thing that they're great at. So if you're looking to have advancement of skills, you're looking to promote your people, like leverage your team because they have all great skills and then have them do peer-led trainings and coaching sessions. Well, you, you've also touched on something else which happens to, well, uh, an omission that occurs, which is that most training is one and done. And yep. uh, training should be ongoing. You should be training your team every week. And yep. uh, they should be training themselves pretty much every day. If you look at the best performers, 
they're constantly listening, reading, learning. And how many books and podcasts and videos are you getting through on an average month, personally? Wow. So I would probably say now, because it's changed, right? Before, it wasn't as much because every single week I was traveling. So I was on a plane, in a lift, in a hotel. I, I didn't do it as much, right? Now I, I've, I'm back on pace. So I'm doing two to three a month books. Podcasts, I'll do probably five to 10 a month. I normally will play like games while I have a podcast in the background. And then I'll like pause a game and then I'll take notes on it, right? As I'm listening to it, because yeah. there's certain tactical advice I want in there. And then in terms of webinars, I don't go to that many webinars, but what I do now is I'll have like YouTube channels I'll watch in the morning. So I'll like do my stretches in the morning and then I'll turn on a YouTube channel that I will follow. It might be an interview. It might be a quick snippet of a how-to and I'll take that information in as well. So I'm always continuously learning no matter what. And I'm continuously growing myself because if you grow your mind, the more you grow your mind, the more results you can get. And if you aren't doing these things, then that's where you're going to start seeing the results that you don't want. Because at the end of the day, you have to be proactively doing out things outside of your nine to five. Outside of your nine to five is where you thrive. I always tell people, and if you're doing these extra things by reading, absorbing resources, getting a mentor, these things are important. I misheard you then. I thought you said breeding for a second. <laughs> you need to do that too. Um, <laughs> Saying it's on the side, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so moving swiftly on before we. <laughs> um, so if I look at the best uh, salespeople that I've ever known, they invite help. Yep. They're vulnerable. They ask for coaching. They get they they actively seek out coaches. I mean, personally, I have six coaches that I go to on a regular basis. I have one for uh, my business. Uh, one for my sales. I have another one for my video. I uh, have a couple more around uh, mental positioning and uh, mental mm. health. And what's interesting is there's not a time goes by where I can't get better. And I think one of the problems is that mentally, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I've got that experience. I don't need to learn. You do, because your competition is just w- going to wipe you out. Yeah, there's yep. an old proverb, which is, if you're green, you grow. If you're ripe, you rot. And I, I think far too many people become functionally illiterate when they leave school. And in sales, it's essential. Virtually every one of the top performing managers and sales leaders I know, as part of their interview, will ask what someone is doing to expand their skills, and yep. what they're reading, what courses they put themselves on. And almost without fail, they won't take someone on who hasn't invested in themselves on a regular basis, let alone within the last six months. You have to. And that was a question we asked in our interview. It was like, what is the last book that you've read and what was the reason you picked it up? And so if someone can't answer that question, then I automatically know, okay, this one person is a proactive learner. That doesn't completely disqualify them, but now I have a different perspective on them. What about if we look at the reps who are really at the top of their game Mm -hmm. and then they make an intentional contribution to others, how far and fast do they get on when they take people under their wing, where they proactively coach? They're going to move faster because what they're doing is, is now they are coaching someone on something that they have seen success with. So now it comes to the test of time is, hey, you did this, but can you articulate it to someone else, right? So that's like the next step of the learning process of the retention process. So you're going to be way further along because you're going to be able to explain things and help others succeed. Whereas, hey, there's some things that you naturally can do and they're unexplainable. You can only do them, right? But if I could break it down to a a process, a system, a formula, that's going to make it more repeatable for everyone in the organization. And that's going to make you more valuable because now you can really articulate and explain things. In order to teach someone, you really have to own that material. And yeah. if you want to master something, it definitely makes sense to teach it. And one of the th- uh, key rules of thumb that I teach my clients is if you learn something, teach it to someone else within 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Morgan, tell me this. What, what are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment? The thing I'm struggling with is, is personally is 
keeping up with family, keeping up with my friends, making sure to keep the intensity with the relationship with my girlfriend. I really struggle with personal relationships because I'm so locked in professionally on certain things. I will just get consumed by it. Like I could, you could lock me in a room for a, for six months and tell me to go work or something. I will just be locked in. So I don't do as well with my personal relationships and I do struggle with that. And they can sometimes be put on the wayside. So what I'm working on now is proactively reaching to my friends, asking them, hey, like, let's hang out, let's watch a game, let's do something, because I will easily just forget that and just like focus on work. And so that that's what I struggle with a good bit. And it's been an ongoing struggle for years. But just during this time, I've been able to obviously slow down. And then now I can have those conversations and, and start building back the relationships that I had that are really strong at the end of the day. Yeah, I struggle with this. Being an obsessive, addictive personality doesn't help. Yeah, it really doesn't. Because <laughs> you're, you're so obsessed with completing this project or accomplishing this initiative, and you just forget everything else. Isn't it more that it's just so much damn fun? Honestly, I haven't done a day's work in 17 years. I just get paid to play. And yeah, yeah. It really is hideously addictive. I'll add to that before your question mark is because one thing I tell people is that the work will never hurt you. And what I mean by that is that people are fickle, right? Like their emotions are wrapped into it. If you put in the work, the work will reward you. It's a, it's a logical and an absolute fact. So because I have a financial logical brain, it's like, all right, well, if you put in the work into this equation, it will equal a result. And there's no way around it that it won't equal a result. And so I, like you said, it's so much fun and it's addicting because I know like if I do this stuff, it will help. When you have personal relationships, humans are humans. So it's like, oh, they're all over the place. And so like, that's, I know that about myself. And I'm always like, oh, if I put in the work, you know, I, I know I can, I can lean on that all day long too. So I don't know if you're the same way, but like, that's how I think about it as well. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so t tell me this, what are you watching, reading, listening to that you really rate and would recommend to others? I really like value payment, Patrick Bet David. I just read his book, Your Next Five Moves. So I, I recommend the book, but also recommend his YouTube channel. Really great there. I also would recommend Tom Bilyeu, Impact um, Theory. All uh, right. Okay. Bilyeu, B I L I E U. Yep. B I L. Yep. That's right. So he's great. I really like his stuff. And then, you know, I was going to give a shout out to my guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's always given just great knowledge and great insights. Like those are the three people that I'm absorbing a lot of their content right now and learning as much as I can. I don't try to learn from like 50 people at once. I feel like that's, that's overwhelming. I normally try to stick it to three to five. So like those three people, I normally watch their content. And I'm like, all right, that makes sense. Let me go ahead and speak on that. And is there a book that's had a life-changing impact on you? The Law of Success by Napoleon Hill. All right. Okay. Have you read uh, Think and Grow Rich? The Devil? So I have not read that one, That's but I've read really Law of Success, Think and Go Rich, but I haven't Outwitting the Devil. I haven't Outwitting the Devil. Uh, I read it a couple of weeks ago. Well worth a, uh, a read. It was good. Also available on Audible now as well. Nice. Uh, okay. I'll go check it out. Good stuff. Okay. You've got a golden ticket. And I know that your 23-year-old idiot self would probably ignore the advice. So this, <laughs> isn't, this isn't about regret. But what one choice bit of advice would you give your 23-year-old self? So I was 23 four years ago. <laughs> so, so, so now i got to figure out what I would tell myself well, four years ago. Like your 18-year-old self. <laughs> let's, go to, let's go to 18. All right, so what would I tell? I think, man, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that like now I think about. I'm like, man, I just wish I would do that. I think this, is, this advice is critical because I think a lot of people struggle with this. And I've been able to now accept this advice, I think at 18, I would have been like, whatever, is truly don't care about anyone else's opinions and stay in your lane. Because a lot of times we just concern ourselves about other people's op opinions and what they're going to say about us. And that prevents us from doing things that we would like to do, creating the content we like to create, taking the job that we like to do. And then now we're just predicated on what other people's opinions are and making other people feel great. When it's ultimately, it's like, no, like, this is what I like to do. This is who I am. This is what I want to go do. This is how I feel about these certain topics. And I don't need to care to anyone else because like, I know who I am. And most people, you know, they interact with don't know you 100%. And that's the advice I would give my 18 year old self because I think we're so, especially in that age, right? You're so consumed about what everyone else is thinking, my, my perception, my, my image, right? Like at this point, it's like, look, like 
do what you need to do, stay in your lane, do what makes you happy, do what makes you fulfilled. And I think a lot of people just only focus on what other people are thinking, which leads them to not have the happiest fulfillment that they are looking for. So be true to yourself. Yeah. And don't fret that other people may or may not like you. Yeah. Don't people please just make sure that you're being true to yourself. Absolutely. Fabulous. Excellent. Morgan, how can people get a hold of you? So best way to get a hold of me is follow me on Instagram at Morgan J. Ingram, or you can also go on LinkedIn, Morgan J. Ingram as well. Those are the two places to go find me. Excellent. Wonderful. Morgan J. Ingram, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, then please get in touch with Morgan or myself. My email address is marcuskauke at me.com and marcus at laughs, L-A-U-G-H-S hyphen last, L-A-S-T dot com, marcus at laughs hyphen last dot com. And if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone who would be, then please put us in touch and I'll see if I can get them on as a guest. In the meantime, stay safe, happy selling. Bye-bye.